The NFL Players Association is suing the league's official sports betting partner. The NBA is looking to bring more automation into its refereeing. We have some details on ESPN's restructuring plans, and we'll also hear about the next steps for USA Swimming coming off the Paris Olympics. It's Thursday, August 29th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're hearing about why the NFLPA is suing DraftKings from my colleague Margaret Fleming, who explains why DraftKings might actually be hoping that a judge rules that the sports betting company broke the law. We're also chatting with USA Swimming COO Shana Ferguson on why Olympic trials are going to be in football stadiums for the foreseeable future, and how they're looking to grow the sport in the wake of a very successful Paris Olympics. We also have some updates on ESPN's plans, a basketball jersey that could break a sales record, and the NBA's growing interest in using Hawkeye to assist referees. First, let's hit some headlines. The NCAA is weighing a proposal to kill the spring transfer window for football players, just two years into the revamped portal system. If the recommendation is implemented, players will only be permitted to transfer during the 30-day window that starts on December 1st. Last year, 2,700 players transferred schools, 900 of which did so during the 15-day April period that is being threatened by this proposal. The NCAA says the goal would be to promote roster stability for student athletes and their programs. Netflix is rolling out another athlete-oriented docuseries, this time focusing on five-profile NBA players. Starting Five, as it is titled, will give fans inside access to the 2023-24 season, both on and off the court, for LeBron James, Jimmy Butler, Anthony Edwards, Jason Tatum, and DeMontis Sabonis. The series is a joint effort between LeBron's production company, Uninterrupted, Peyton Manning's Omaha Productions, and Barack Obama's Higher Ground. It will debut on October 9th. We know the venue's streaming package is not going to be ready for the upcoming NFL season, but now it seems like the case won't even be revisited until after the Super Bowl. A Monday memo from Judge Margaret M. Garnett said the earliest that this case would go to trial would be February of 2025. The combination service with Warner Bros. Discovery, Disney, and Fox Sports Properties was supposed to debut in September at a starting price of $42.99 per month before the launch was blocked in court for antitrust reasons. Five Uruguayan soccer players have been issued suspensions from CONMEBOL for their involvement in a brawl with Colombia fans during a Copa America match last month. The list is headed by Liverpool forward Darwin Nunez, who will be banned for his next five Uruguay team matches. Other players were issued bans for three to five games each. The suspension means they will miss World Cup qualifiers, but the players are all still permitted to play for the respective club teams in full capacity. The NFLPA is suing DraftKings for $65 million, alleging that the sportsbook breached a 2021 contract to use the name, image, and likeness of players in their NFT marketplace, which has since been shut down. According to the court filing, DraftKings does not intend to pay out the remaining guaranteed payments. The NFLPA notes the income for five DK executives since the contract was signed, $261 million, and says that the total compensation of just these five aforementioned officers since 2021 is approximately quadruple of what DraftKings owes the NFLPA licensors. My colleague Margaret Fleming discusses what this could mean for DraftKings, the NFL's official betting partner, in a conversation coming up next. Joined now by Front Office Sports Breaking News reporter Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you on. So the NFLPA is suing DraftKings. What's this lawsuit all about? It's an interesting one, let me tell you. So the NFLPA is suing DraftKings in short for what it's alleging is breach of contract and owing approximately $65 million. The details are kind of interesting here. It's about the NFT marketplace that DraftKings recently uh, shut down uh, in July. Um, and basically, the NFLPA and DraftKings had a deal to, you know, do the name, image, and likeness of NFL players, not to be confused with college NIL, but same kind of thing here to kind of sort of like a marketing thing um, for DraftKings uh, NFT marketplace. Um, and DraftKings, in shutting down the marketplace, um, the NFLPA is saying in this lawsuit, uh, still owes uh, the union a lot of money. So. Um, it's interesting here, kind of back and forth. This is kind of a lawsuit about another lawsuit and also about NFTs. It's, it's kind of confusing, but um, it's really interesting because, I mean, the NFL is an official partner with DraftKings. Um, so a lot of moving pieces and big deals and a lot of money going on here. Right. Yeah. The NFL can't be too thrilled that their Players Association is, is suing one of their, their main betting partners, which obviously is, uh, you know, an increasingly large part of their business. Um, so yeah, the, 
just to, to kind of piece this all together. So yeah, NFTs, <laughs> I bet there are people listening who don't even remember what NFTs are, but they were like, you know, a huge market a couple of years ago. And now, you know, I haven't, it's been a while since I've heard much about NFTs. Um, but so yeah, that, that market is dying down and DraftKings shut down their, their NFT platform. Uh, but they still had this deal. And if it's, this happened with the NFLPA, I have to wonder if there are other players associations and other groups that, that might have a similar claim. Um, but yeah, you mentioned there's another lawsuit here. Um, tell us how that kind of connects. Yeah, that's the really interesting part of this, uh, the most interesting part to me. So basically, the reason the drafting shut down was because there was this other lawsuit in Massachusetts where a judge recently denied DraftKings motion to throw it aside to get rid of it um, and said the lawsuit can go forward. And that lawsuit was saying, um, it, it was alleging that um, DraftKings, the NFT marketplace, violated securities laws. Um, and so the judge didn't say one way or another whether it violated securities laws. It just said, we can't throw out this, um, you know, we can't throw out this lawsuit. It can proceed and go forward. Um, and so DraftKings then, um, when it when it closed its marketplace shortly after, it said due to recent legal developments, um, and at that same time ended its deal with the NFLPA. And so the NFLPA um, said DraftKings in its lawsuit, uh, you know, on Monday said that DraftKings said that the judge said that the ruling meant that it you know violated its uh, the securities laws, and there was a clause in their contract that said that DraftKings wouldn't have to pay the NFLPA everything if some kind of government body found that it violated securities laws. So basically, to sum that up in a lot fewer words, um, the DraftKings says it's okay to end our agreement because this judge found that, you know, we broke the law doing this. Um, and the NFLPA is saying, no, the judge didn't say you broke the law doing this, um, and you still owe us $65 million. They didn't say $65 million. They said um, the amount that these five executives have made since 2021 is quadruple what you owe us. Um, so kind of a, a weird and cheeky way to put that. But um, but that's kind of what is tied into this other lawsuit. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting here that DraftKings made that claim and that the NFLPA is kind of advocating for DraftKings here in a weird way. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. Yeah, right. so the NFLPA, instead of saying $65 million, just gave us a math problem and said, you know, these executives made was $260 million and divide that yeah. by four and you have the amount that yeah. we're owed. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, yeah, now DraftKings is in kind of the weird scenario of apparently kind of wanting a judge to rule that they broke the law. Uh, so that they can get out of this contract and maybe other contracts. And I guess we're just going to, that seems like it has to be the next domino to fall here so that we can know if the NFLPA's contract is still live and if there are other consequences for DraftKings. I mean, that's a big thing, like what the NFLPA was saying, kind of what you're saying before about like NFTs or something we haven't really heard about in a while, kind of not really the hot topic anymore. And the NFLPA is like, just because it's not the hot topic anymore, and just because this didn't really work out, it doesn't mean you can't pay us. So it, it's it's kind of this weird shift where like, are people really paying attention to this anymore? Do people care? But there's still kind of lasting uh, legal and like financial ramifications of these big deals that were made. Yeah. Yeah. And just <clears throat> quoting from your piece up on frontofficesports.com, uh, the NFLPA has a line in their suit that says DraftKings is, you know, they're also facing a civil lawsuit. Buyer's remorse, however, is not a basis to terminate a contract. And I feel like that is kind of the NFT world in a nutshell right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not what it used to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see what yeah. happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Margaret Fleming, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. The Paralympics begin today, and NBC is bringing back some of its best features from the Paris Olympics for the broadcast. That starts with Gold Zone, a whip-around show that jumped from sport to sport and quickly became a fan favorite. Scott Hansen hosted it during the main games earlier this month, but the new version of the show will feature Carolyn Mono, a sports reporter for NBC Sports and CNN. This will be her sixth Paralympic Games. Brazilian soccer player Vinicius Jr. said that his Real Madrid team will walk off the pitch mid-match if they hear any more racist chants from Spanish fans. 
Benicius has been the victim of multiple racist acts in the past few years, including an effigy of the Brazilian star being hung from a bridge and verbal abuse caught on camera in a 2023 match that resulted in prison sentences for two men. In April, Vinicius said in an interview that his experiences with fans in Madrid pushed him away from soccer. Looking back on that tape, he said, that interview was very important not only for me, but for all the people who trust me and give me a lot of strength so I can keep fighting for all black people who suffer daily. UEFA does have a three-step system in place for referees to handle racist behavior, the last of which is ending the match entirely. However, it seems like the Real Madrid players aren't going to wait around for the ref to handle things. Benicius Jr. told CNN, Not just me, but all players said that if that happens, the next time everyone has to leave the field, so that all of those people who have insulted us have to pay a much bigger penalty. He added that, We need to leave the field so things can change as soon as possible. The NBA is hiring for a role that will help bring more automation into refereeing. Specifically, the league wants a technical lead manager whose responsibilities include being, quote, the architect of the new team, building it from the ground up to develop and deploy automated officiating capabilities to impact every game of the NBA season. The league is not going to robot refs just yet, however. Last season was the NBA's first working with Sony's Hawkeye system, and a source told Front Office Sports that the technology was used mostly to assist with deciding out of bounds and goaltending calls. The league is also interested in using technology to decide if, like Smokey from The Big Lebowski, a player was over the line on three-pointers. If you have eight years of experience building and leading perception teams that leverage computer vision and machine learning for real-time applications and a love of basketball, a $350,000 salary and a major impact on the NBA could be in your future. Earlier this week, ESPN president Burke Magnus rolled out significant changes to the content arm of the network, including naming Mike McQuaid as executive vice president of sports production. More changes are on the horizon as the company announced a slew of new launches on Wednesday. Among the offerings will be a Where to Watch feature in the ESPN app, which builds on the existing feature of game schedules. Only now, each listing will have a bug that indicates where you can watch, even if it is not on ESPN. As ever-evolving streaming bundles and altcasts become the way of the future, the Bristol-based giant wants to be the hub for sports fans who navigate it all. Speaking of altcasts, ESPN is home to perhaps the best known of them all. The Manning cast was already set to feature Bill Belichick, but it was announced on Wednesday that the legendary coach would be a featured guest for each of the first nine weeks of the season. On top of that, Belichick and Peyton Manning will tag team a 30-minute studio show every Friday, looking ahead to Monday Night Football. Who said Belichick wouldn't have a job this year? Up next, USA Swimming was already having a great summer before winning 28 medals in Paris. In June, over 20,000 people showed up to watch the Olympic swimming trials at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, making it the largest crowd ever for a swim meet. I spoke to USA Swimming COO Shayna Ferguson on all of that and what's next for the organization. I'm joined now by Shayna Ferguson, COO of USA Swimming. Welcome, Shayna. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So, you know, we're coming off the Paris Olympics, which, you know, I think were considered a pretty huge success for the games as a whole. What did you learn about swimming as a spectator sport from the Paris Olympics? Oh, I mean, that's a, that's a, a great question. We learned quite a bit this summer in general about swimming as a spectator sport, both at the Olympic trials, which I, which I know we'll speak about, but also at the Paris games. Um, the French certainly turned out in big numbers um, to watch the local hometown hometown hero in, in Leanne Marchand, but also the Americans really, really rip it through the water. Um, that stadium was packed every night. The um, the the place was really rocking, which was neat. Um, I think folks back here in the States mentioned, you know, how how, how wonderful it was to, to watch. So I don't think, Owen, we ever really struggle with swimming as a spectator sport during the Olympic Games. I think, you know, the stadiums are generally full and people are tuning in. Um, what we are concerned about and what we're certainly working towards here at USA Swimming is figuring out how to make this sport, which for many is a niche sport in the States, m much more of a spectator sport. Along those lines. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about a, a few angles on that. But there were swimming trials at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. Why... Why did you think, and you know, this was a, a big success, you know, you got record crowds for, for a swimming event. Um, why did you guys think this would work in the first place to put, yeah, and to go through the hassle of, I'm also curious about how you got a swimming pool in a football stadium, but yeah, to set that all up and, and get fans. Um, yeah. Why did you think that would work? Well, at the, at the, at the very base of it, there is simply no existing natatorium in the United States that could hold a meet 
of the magnitude of an Olympic trials, period, end of story. And for the last four or five Olympic trials, we had to go elsewhere. We had to build temporary pools, first in a parking lot in Long Beach, and then for four trials at, in Omaha in a basketball slash hockey arena. Now, demand for those tickets in Omaha was so great. I mean, it's simple economics. The demand was greater than the supply. We knew that that building was too small. And if we really want to grow the sport, we really want to grow the fan base and the participant base, we're going to need to go to a bigger building. The only building bigger than a college hockey slash basketball arena is likely an NBA arena or an NHL arena. Both sports are still in season when we need that building in May to, to bring in the temporary pools and in June to execute. So the next <laughs> the next option really is an NFL stadium where we could certainly have the building in, in all of May and all of June. So we knew as soon as we had grown out of that amazing space in Omaha, we knew it really practically need to be in an NFL stadium. This was many years ago. We started scoping this. Um, and so really the RFP went out. Um, oh, my goodness. And probably 2019, then COVID kind of changed things. Yeah, we've known for many years that 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 likely, you know, Omaha would have its last trials in 2020. Really, it was 2021. Um, and so we did speak to quite a few NFL stadiums. There were a few uh, cities interested. We settled on Indianapolis for many reasons. And then we set about figuring out, to your earlier question, how do you even put swimming pools in a football stadium? Good news is we used the same people who had put those swimming pools in a hockey arena. Now it's going to be different. It's a bigger building. It's a different building. Luckily, the folks at Lucas Oil Stadium were along for the adventure with us because um, it is different. It is a much, much bigger building. And so the good news is we already knew how to put temporary pools in an arena. We just needed to figure out how to put them in a football stadium. Yeah. And what's the hardest part of that? Yeah, we, we, we had some nerves. I mean, Omaha, we knew very well. We knew where all of the um, what the drainage um, um, operations would look like. We knew where all the electrical outlets were. We knew that arena really well. We didn't have that same familiarity at Lucas Oil Stadium. So we had to figure out how to get water in from street level, which is really the 100 level in Lucas Oil Stadium. It's not field level. We had to get that turf up. We had to, you know, figure out how to heat the the pool when there wasn't already a heat exchanger system in this stadium. Yeah, um, there was a lot we still needed to figure out. But again, um, you know, we worked on this thing for three years, so we had the time and the runway to do it. And then thanks again to Lucas Oil Stadium, they gave us a lot of time to actually move in. We had really almost the entire month of May. And then, you know, we executed it in mid-June. So we had about six weeks of runway to 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 get those pools in and to execute. And if you can speak to why Indianapolis versus, you know, I won't make you name the other ones, but um, but why was that the choice? Well, first the bids from the other cities, cities were all excellent. So I, w I do want to make that very clear. Any of those cities would have executed an exceptional Olympic trials, but the Indianapolis bid was the best. Um, there's many tangibles, certainly walkability, um, hotel availability, really no need for any ground transportation once you're in that in that city. But there were many intangibles as well. Um, the spirit of volunteerism in Indianapolis is it just blew us away. We were, I don't want to say surprised by, but certainly delighted by the thousands of volunteers who came out to help us do this. We needed at least hundreds of volunteers in order to be able to execute this. Um, so this concept of service and this concept of volunteerism is so shines so brightly in Indianapolis. That was one major intangible. They also brought, or we partnered with Indiana Sports Corp. They also brought some concepts to the table that, quite frankly, we weren't thinking of. So much of my focus is on conducting the most flawlessly, the most technically flawless meet that ever there was. So I'm a little bit myopically focused on what's going to happen inside that stadium. I hope the fan experience is fantastic, and I certainly want it to be fantastic, but I can't give it as much attention necessarily as those who live there and and you know and and understand the city as well as they do. So so Indiana Sports Corp and the, and really the entire community, be it businesses, sponsors, bars, restaurants, really threw themselves behind this experience and gave those fans something to focus on when they weren't inside that building and and that really was, just blew us away.
for 2028, you're going to uh, run it yeah. back, but this time in SoFi Stadium in LA, which makes a lot of sense because that's where the games are themselves. But um, how are you expecting that to be different from your past experience? Well, we aren't doing the Olympic trials in SoFi Stadium. The games definitely are. You heard that announcement was actually made during our trials, which might have been where some of the confusion was. Um, I, it was a little confusing for LA 28 to announce that at our trials. But so the Olympic Games will be in SoFi Stadium. They will put two big swimming pools in a football stadium, much like we just did in Indianapolis. We will stage a trials a month prior to the games, much like we do and, and did. Um, but it will not be in SoFi Stadium. It, operationally, it wouldn't work for us to have the trials there and then the games. So, um, so we will do it though. But, but, but Owen, we've got to do it in a football stadium again. We can't backtrack. We can't go to a smaller arena. We've already raised the bar for all of aquatics, quite frankly. So we'll be in a football stadium again. I'm not ready to announce that anytime soon. Although it seems silly, I would even say that since we're still in this Olympic year. But, the, but we have to have these conversations. It takes us years to plan an event of this magnitude. So soon we'll be excited to, to announce where we're heading for 2028 trials. How are you going to, you know, get people interested in, in other stuff, you know, when there isn't that Olympics name attached to it? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question and something I've been focusing on. I've been here at USA Swimming for about five and a half years, and it's been always top of mind for me to, to figure out how to attract athletes to this sport. We're a membership-based organization. We have about 380,000 members of USA Swimming. So while so much of our focus is on Katie Ledecky and the 48 athletes who went to the Olympic team, as our focus should be, it isn't entirely our focus. We are focused on the grassroots athlete that Shana, when I was nine years old and I was a swimmer who was never gonna go to the Olympic trials, but swimming was my sport of choice. We are 365 days a year in every year of the quad focused on that nine-year-old athlete and the 20,000 coaches who comprise our membership as well. Um, and so, so I generally want, want the, the lift, the excitement of the Olympic Games or the lift of the Olympic trials to attract more kids and quite frankly, more families to our sport. That's what we're spending a lot of our time on. How do we make swimming the sport of choice for all when parents are trying to choose whether to put their kid into soccer full time or hockey full time or whatever the case may be. So much of our focus is on grassroots recruitment and giving our clubs and our coaches the tools that they need to be able to bring more athletes into the sport. Another unique um, aspect of swimming is that we are arguably the only sport where if you don't know how to do it, you could die. There is some inherent danger in, involved in not knowing how to swim. You don't have to be able to swim a fast hundred butterfly, but you do from a life-saving perspective need to know how to swim. And we take that responsibility very, very strongly. It matters a lot to us. So not only are we focused on trying to get kids to choose competitive swimming as their sport, we also want to ensure that every little kid and every adult knows how to swim for safety so we've got a little bit more to our purpose here at USA Swimming than just putting athletes on the podium in international competition. What does that mission, what does that actually look like, you know, out in the world yeah. where, you know, you're trying to get little kids to swim and kids a little bigger to, to swim competitively? How do you, what, what are the steps yeah. there? Yeah, it, it, what it looks like is we are a member serving organization. We have to ensure that our coaches, our clubs, our local swim committees, our families are being given the resources that they need, the services that they need. Um, this gets a, a little bit maybe nuanced or maybe not even all of that exciting, but are our clubs all properly insured? Do our coaches have the education they need to be the best that they can be from a, from a you know technical swim perspective and also from an athlete protection standpoint? Safe sport and the protection of our athletes is top of mind for us at all times as well. Our coaches, our team leaders, are the administrators of these teams properly equipped to ensure that these young athletes, remember the preponderance of our members are under the age of 18. So we also have a responsibility to these families to ensure that when their parents are dropping their kids off to swim practice, those kids are safe and they're in, a, in, a, in a, an environment to help them succeed and excel and not to be in any sort of danger. So we are always thinking about that as part of our mission as well. And remember too, like I said earlier, while we are focusing on the Olympic team, we're always thinking about them. 
We're also thinking about the kid like me who wants to go to swim practice for her physical and mental health and for the camaraderie and for the excitement of being able to swim in a regional meet without ever having any dreams of going to the Olympics. And we take that very, very seriously and are constantly thinking about how we can communicate better with our members, how we can provide them better services. They are paying a membership fee to be a part of USA Swimming and to be a part of their local swim club. So um, 365 days a year, all year round, we are thinking about that nine-year-old as much as we're thinking about Katie Ledecky and everything in between. We're thinking about those swim coaches. We're thinking about those the livelihood of those swim coaches and the mental and physical health of them. I haven't even mentioned our officials, our officials. We have 15,000 officials who are members of USA Swimming. What kind of education are they getting? What kind of benefits are they receiving? How are they being treated? How are they being given opportunities? So um, we truly are a member serving organization who will use an Olympic year to um, to popularize the sport, to, to remind people that we, are, while we're not one of the big four, maybe not even top 10, most um, most watched sport in the U.S. that we are here and that we aren't just a once every four year sport. It's possible I've just been spoiled by two or three singular people like Katie Ledecky, Michael Phelps, me, one or two others. But it swimming is one of the sports when the Olympics come around. I expect the U.S. to to win, get a lot of gold medals. Why has the U.S. program been so successful? Oh, that's a fantastic question. And one we think about a lot because you heard me just say we aren't a top four pro sport. We aren't even likely a top 10 or top 15 most watched sport, right? Which is which makes us struggle when we're talking about broadcast deals and, and viewership and so on and so forth. Um, we in the U.S. have the best facilities. So that's one. We have the best coaching. We have the best coach education. Um, we have the best offerings. We've got these folks you know, in all 50 states and all 59 of our local swim committees who are so focused on recruiting athletes, giving them great experiences, helping them be fantastic. In some cases, helping them get get to a college and swim in a in in university, right? Or helping them get on the national team or helping them get, you know, ultimately to the podium in the Olympics, which is where casual fans like you are seeing them and are paying attention. But the grassroots really base of that pyramid and the amount of um, focus and resources we put into building that base, be it, you know, having the best facilities, having the best coach education, having the best services for our members helps us build that base that ultimately, once you get to this, you know, summit in, in an Olympic Games year, helps you, you know, see the results of that, you know, production all year long or all quad long. Again, the best facilities we've got. Um, you know, nearly 400, over 380,000 members for one sports, really youth focused um, um, base is going to produce some pretty talented athletes for certain. So, and there's also great heritage in it, right? There's a lot of pride in being an American swimmer. We have been fantastic. We haven't lost an international competition since the 1960s. There's some pride in that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty incredible. Shane Ferguson, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. One of the most coveted pieces of sports memorabilia will go to auction next month. LeBron James's chosen one jersey from his high school days at St. Vincent St. Mary's is projected to sell for anywhere between $1 million and $2 million, which would make it the highest valued basketball jersey ever. Julian's Auctions will also be selling printed photos that show LeBron behind the scenes of those photo shoots. CEO David Goodman calls the items some of the most emblematic and important pieces of sports and entertainment history. The Chosen One is a reference to the Sports Illustrated cover that launched LBJ into mass startup. The story ran in February of 2002, and one year later LeBron was the number one pick in the NBA draft for his hometown Cleveland Cavaliers. James has changed his jersey number a few times throughout his career, but the Chosen One jersey sports his signature 23 that he rocked when he entered the NBA and wore until he left Cleveland for the Miami Heat in 2010. The Fighting Irish jersey was already sold once in 2021 for a half a million dollars. Three years later, as LeBron gears up for his 22nd NBA season, it could be worth more than four times that much. As my colleague Eric Fisher said on the show yesterday in discussing why the NFL was allowing in private equity money, the league had become a victim of its own success when it comes to team valuations. A quick glance at the Forbes billionaires list shows why. 
520 people in the entire world have enough wealth to match the commander's sale price of $6 billion. And of course, most of them wouldn't actually want to convert a large portion of their assets into an NFL team, and some of the ones that do want to already have. The NFL doesn't require the principal owner to hold 100% of the team, but the overlap of people who can buy an NFL team and people that want to is getting smaller by the year. That said, private equity can only help so much. Teams can only be 10% owned by PE firms, so a $6 billion team like the Commanders would still have to find $5.4 billion from its ownership group if private equity covered everything it could. Finally, I'm curious if cities and states are going to use this as a reason to not give out money for new stadiums. After all, why do these billionaire owners need the cash when there are firms paying for the privilege to hand them $600 million? Celtic star Drew Holiday worked a shift at the Register at a Raising Cane's in downtown Boston and then spoke to the media. Here he is answering the question of who is the biggest trash talker on Team USA. Uh, Anthony Edwards. <laughs> 100%. 100%. I mean, he's a great, he's a great young player, and you see him trash talking from there. Just one more reason the Timberwolves are an exciting team this year. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend you think would like it too, and make sure you are subscribed. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.